Hello everyone, I am Zach Peterson. Welcome back to the show floor at PCB West 2025. I am sitting here with Margaret Upshore, CEO and founder of Mobius Materials. Margaret, how are you doing today? Doing well, yeah. yeah. Your booth is like literally right there. <laughs> yeah, um, been, been in view of the <laughs> recording most yeah. of the day. Yeah. yeah, and I've seen actually quite a few people coming over and talking to you. Um, so I thought it was great to come and have you come on and sit down and talk with us just a little bit. So if you could tell us a little bit about Mobius Materials. Sure. Yeah. So we are building a stock market for semiconductors and other electronic components. It's pretty exciting because we're trying to bring a level of liquidity that doesn't exist today to the electronics components industry. Right now, if you and I was actually uh, on the hardware manufacturing side, you can get pretty screwed in a variety of ways. Like basically you can overbuy or you can underbuy. You can't get it right. That's pretty much impossible. But um, we help companies uh, liquidly trade if they do either one of those things. They can sell on our platform or they can buy on short lead times. So give us an example. Who is a buyer and who is a seller? Is a buyer like, let's say, an EMS that just has overstock? Yeah. Um, Honestly, the same company can be both, and a lot of times they are. We get a huge overlap because okay. if you think about it, you know, let's say you're building a tablet or something, you are probably selling from the older version of that tablet, and then you're probably buying for the newer version. So you are really both a buyer and a seller. I see, I see. So they yeah. may be selling the old version of a memory chip, they're buying the new one. Yeah, that's right, that's okay. right. Yeah, okay. but then as I was talking to you about earlier, we also have some customers that are kind of traders on the site too. And so that's driving a little bit, they're kind of like market makers you'd see in a commodities market. Um, and so they're also driving some of the volume on the site. Now, that, that's one thing I was gonna ask yeah. you, because that's pretty crazy, yeah. right? I mean, you have people who could come onto your platform and literally just buy and sell at spot prices. That's right. Yeah, and they can make money doing that. It's kind of wild um, because the prices underlying all of this are moving. And I think that's what's so crazy actually about the market right now and why why a little bit we have a kind of a brittle industry in semiconductors and electronic components because you don't see price fluctuation in our industry. You only see lead time fluctuation, which actually really sucks. If we have a shortening, a tightening of demand on a single chip, then what happens is that guy goes to all the people who are buying and say, hey, I know you bought that stuff and you had a eight week lead time, but actually now it's 52 weeks. So yeah. good luck, <laughs> you <Yeah>. know? <laughs> and that's just so much worse than if you were to say, hey, actually, you know, prices are, are floating, demand has gone up and now the price is higher. So we're, we have a little bit of a different approach there. It, it almost seems like by allowing the price to, to float in that way through a marketplace, you could get companies that are uh, acting faster to try and figure out what's an alternative if, yeah. if all of a sudden the price is going to exceed their budget. Yeah, that's exactly right. What I envision the world becoming is more of a every supply chain manager who's per, or procurement manager is becoming essentially a trader. So they're buying when the market looks good, they're buying up for their production run. If the market looks bad, maybe they're putting in more long-term buys. So, um, so th this I think would they be can like really a, be reactive. Well, yeah. th this would be like a futures contract. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so futures are just a contract to buy at a certain price over a long time period. That's exactly the same as a purchase order. And right now, a purchase order is much worse than a futures contract because a purchase order uh, is non cancelable, non refundable, and non sellable. Meaning, like, I if I get if I issue a purchase order, yeah, the the person with the PO, yeah, can't go and trade it to somebody else. No, no. But with a, with a futures contract through your platform, they could. Yeah, yeah. That is insane. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I know. And, so, and so wait, wait, wait a minute. Oh, like, okay, yeah. Wait, wait, wait. I'm about so, to get into more rants. So no, no, I, I want to. Yeah. I want to hear the rants. But yeah. does that mean that I could come on to your platform and start buying and selling call options on resistors? You can't do, do haul options right now, okay. but just give me a year, okay? Give it a year. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you could you can make money trading chips on the platform right now. Yeah. Okay. And we, I mean, we work just like a commodities market would. Like we take a uh, like 
fixed transaction fee on the parts. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So if if somebody has a large number of resistors, right? They want to sell their, you know, let's say ten thousand resistors, right? Yeah. They they can go onto the platform. They can see what the price it's currently trading at, and they can decide. Yeah, I want to do this through this platform. Or maybe they can find some, you know, re distributor in China, let's say, and yeah. you know, sell it into the gray market. Yeah, they could try. Um, I'd say we typically are gonna give you better prices than that gray market would, because we have less middlemen for you to go through. Every time you okay. hit a middleman layer, you know, you're eating away 40% of the cost, and again and again. So usually, if you sell on us, you're typically getting people about three times the rates they get at brokers. Um, but if you think you can get a higher rate on your broker, you can actually just invite them to bid on Mobius. <laughs> so, you know, either way, you're good to go. <laughs> wow, um, I didn't even think about it like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, those brokers that you get better rates with, that sounds like a great customer for me too. So, uh, bring it I get on. it. There, there's actually kind of a tangent to that, which okay. is, you know, if if you were working with the gray market, right? Yeah. There's a lot of risk of, of counterfeits, uh -huh. right? Yeah. And you know, you don't always know what you're buying. Parts get misrepresented. Parts are outright yes. fakes. Yeah. Parts might look like they're in genuine packaging. Really, they're repackaged right, or they're right, reclaimed right. or something like this. Yeah, this is a huge problem. And this is kind of why Mobius never existed before, in my okay. opinion. I think that gray market is very dirty. Everybody knows it. And pretty much every customer that comes to our site has been scammed in some way there before i personally have accidentally bought like empty box chips like it's just a package you're like oh um you know and other things like that so the the people have a lot of heartburn over it uh and i think that's a lot of what's poisoned the well why these transactions never happened before um what we've done to to do that to alleviate that is we have two inspection hubs one's in virginia and one's in hong kong and before any buyer receives any part from us, it goes through those hubs. We do a full inspection, EVI, like really standard stuff. And then we also give you 14 days to inspect on your own. So um, we do like occasionally find failures at that step, usually due to storage type issues, but we've never had an issue once it's gotten to the customer. It's like gone through so many checks. It's like very airtight. And we're talking about stuff that, you know, we're talking about stuff where the chain of custody is intact. So. It's coming from maybe a Fortune 500 company that has it in their like ISO, oh, you know, one million yeah, <laughs> warehouse. <yeah. laughs> so like, you know, it's it's really solid material from the beginning. Okay, so that was actually going to be going to be my next question is you know what's what's the flow of components, right? Because you know if I'm a seller, do do I sit here and I hold on to my inventory until? it gets cleared for purchase through the platform and only then do I have to ship it to a facility in Virginia or in Hong Kong? Yeah, just in time shipping. Okay. Because okay. we wouldn't want you to ship, you know, every part you have. If some are, you know, there's some parts that honestly, they don't do well in the secondary market. So mm -hmm. think it's like, maybe it's a, a really low value resistor. Okay. okay, let's say that thing is a thousandth of a cent and you're buying, even say you're buying a million of them, you're still gonna save, if you had a huge savings on that, you're still gonna save like 50 bucks, you know? Sure, sure. It's just not, the bang for the buck isn't there, so that sort of stuff doesn't sell that well. And so we do just-in-time shipping, we only want you to ship when it sells. Okay, yeah. okay. But for, you know, higher value components, we're talking like, you know, microcontrollers. That stuff is ABCs, awesome. ABCs, right? That does really well. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. Okay, so somebody will, their, their order to sell gets cleared, right? That means there's a buyer on the other side of it, right? Mm -hmm. They go through the shipping process, they, you know, ship yeah. it over to the lab, it goes yeah. through testing. So does, does the buyer's money basically go into escrow at that point? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I mean, that's another thing I wanted to protect against. Again, I was coming from a lot of trauma, so I needed <laughs> to make sure, I, you know, I had obviously as well gotten financially scammed by the gray market, all this stuff. So we want to make sure everything is locked down, it's super easy, and we're like, you know, we're with the manufacturers the whole step. So you will never the transaction happens through us so you transact with a u.s company you have one transaction 
and we hold the money in escrow. So it's all safe. We can get it rolled back if there's any issue. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So you've got really these multiple layers of protection, right? From the testing to find counterfeits to financial protection. Yeah. What, one thing I'm wondering here though is, is what is the level of testing exactly? And, and I bring that up because, um, you know, it's like a cat and mouse game with mm -hmm. counterfeiters, yeah. right? They just, they get more creative, the testing gets more creative and everybody's one upping each other. Who, who's, in, who's responsible for ensuring that the testing is at the, the most cutting edge it possibly can be? Mm. Is it you guys? Is it a third party testing lab? Are you guys doing the testing? How does that all work? We have it. It's almost a decision tree that we would put th parts through. So there definitely are some parts that are more risky than other parts. Okay. And there you can also, we also know so much information about where these parts came from. So what, one thing, this is a really interesting point. So the, if you are selling on the secondary market, you don't want to tell anybody you're selling on the secondary market. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Okay. Let's say it is a big company. They're selling the same firm. That is data leaking out because you, oh, I didn't you think are about just, it like that. you're hemorrhaging data about how well did your product do? How many did you sell? What are you going to put in your next product? Oh, you're definitely not putting in a XYZ LTE module or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And so, and also it's just embarrassing. Yeah. <laughs> People are embarrassed, even though everybody has, you know, 5% of their purchases like end up on this in this state they still like consider it a black mark for some reason so, what's, what's interesting about about yeah. what you just said though is um you know the the data leakage i mean i could almost see other companies speculating on the sellers <laughs> if they knew the yeah. sellers were selling all these components yeah so we don't want to we want to protect those we want to protect all the customers in that way so everything's anonymized okay when you transact you can't find out who anybody is, and it's even like kind of mixed together in a, in a way to kind of make sure that it's super anonymized. But Mobius has the data, and so what's interesting is when you buy at Hua Chong Bay. Like I, I don't know if you've ever been there. It's I like, haven't. It's this giant market where you can just buy any chip on the world in the world, but it's a buyer beware. Yeah. Madhouse. So. If you buy in Hua Chang Bay, you've lost all chain of ownership. You have no idea where these are coming from. Okay. But we, for every part we have, we know, okay, this came from XYZ, ama like an amazingly locked down company. And then we know those guys bought it from direct. Sure, or sure. whatever. They got it direct from the franchise distributor, yeah. let's say. So, in the, so when we see any chip lot, we already know, okay, this is this a, this came from the original manufacturer originally or not? So we can already put a risk profile to each batch. And so we use that when we have high risk profile batches, we send it through like electrical testing, x-ray, decap, EVI. We send it through the battery. Yeah. And it, when we have uh, batches that are a lower risk profile, we, by standard, we do EVI testing and we also do like you know, a bunch of uh, product level like testing too. Sure. So we kind of choose depending on what we know already about the lot. So when, when someone is on the platform and let's say they need to buy, you know, you know I'm gonna throw out a part number here, right? They need to yeah. buy AT Mega 328, right? Yeah. They're gonna buy that classic microcontroller, right? Yeah. If, if they see that there is AT Mega 328 for sale through the Mobius platform, are they are they seeing lots or do they just see somebody has a million units for sale and they, it could be one person it could be 10 people right or 10 companies i guess yeah you have no idea they'd see all the at megas and so okay. when they buy like we might be so they're not buying specific lots yeah they're that's just, right okay. we would be collapsing that for them and but they would receive by the way a test report so sure they can sure. look at that test report if it's not enough testing for them, we'll do more testing. Like, that's gotcha. cool. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. But I, you know what, we just like, we're all about, okay, this should be as easy as buying on Amazon. You know, you could, should just be able to buy this, these chips. It should be easy. And if you have to think about, oh, this lot, are they really that different? No. The only thing that's different is when am I going to get it? And what is the, can I be sure of the quality? So as long as we can standardize those two things, they're fungible, you know? Yeah. 
this is really interesting because you, you are creating a market that's kind of divorced from the franchise distributors. I mean, if you think away about the way like the oil market works, right? Yeah. There's a spot price for oil, but right. everybody else that sells oil and oil derived, you know, products derived from, from crude oil, right? Their prices all have to adjust based on that, mm -hmm. right? Do the franchise distributors not pay attention to these kind of day-to-day -day moves in some of these component prices? Or is it just the volume is too small to affect what they do? I think right now there is a huge market that's trading in this already. There is a spot market, but it's unseparatable from the black, the gray market. Okay. So I, the estimates I've seen from analysts is that the gray market slash spot market is a $25 billion market. Okay. That is massive. Yeah, that is. <laughs> <laughs> so like, okay, college, like the whole college sports, that's a nineteen billion dollar market. You know, just like so as just, an example, <laughs> just the gray market for components I'm is pretty, bigger than college sports. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure you have to fact check me on that. But um, it's a giant market. The thing is, they don't play there because it is, you know, it's like they don't play there at all. Yeah, I think that they probably would be interested. Mm -hmm. Um, and but what they haven't been able to do is get the price movement. Mm -hmm. And I believe that they're bound by some agreements on that. So maybe they aren't able to. I'm not exactly sure. Interesting. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it, it, would, it would be interesting to see the extent to which there's enough volume on a platform like this to where they now start, start having to float their prices yeah. because there's yeah. too much competition. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, could, I, could, I think it will happen. That's what I'm betting on. That's what you're betting on. Yeah. Okay. So what's it going to take for... I don't know, DigiKey to start maybe, you know, putting some of their components through one of these markets? Or they would they even be allowed to do that? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm sure they they also have access. All these distributors end up with access too. Right. And and what's interesting as well is that even the original manufacturers end up with access. So, you know, if you are building modules, if you're, you know, ST or something, you're gonna also have access. Um, the question is for all these people when they're up the chain from the manufacturer layer is does dumping that excess hurt me or help me? So if you are a manufacturer, say your ST and you were to dump excess parts on a secondary market, does that help you or does that cannibalize your existing customers? Yeah. You know, my feeling on it and my take, but obviously I'm, I'm biased in a lot of ways, is that secondary market transactions are gonna happen regardless of you know, what those original manufacturers do. Well, it's, when, it's true, they've been happening for yeah, who knows how long, Exactly, right? and so you know, if, the, if they were really interested in the secondary market, they could get a piece of the pie, you know? Sure, So. sure. Well, I guess we don't even really know if they actually do get a piece of the pie already. Yeah, do that's we? true. We don't know. Okay, that's fair. Okay, this is extremely interesting. <laughs> Anytime, so the folks who know me probably know that I, I have a second love beyond electronics, which is finance. So I always love it when the, <laughs> the two worlds just smash into each other as they're doing right now. So this is super cool. Um, if anyone is interested in learning more about Mobius, what do they need to do? Um, go to our website. It's free to sign up. It's free to use. So um, go to our website. It's uh, MobiusMaterials.com. So it's M-O-B-I-U-S Materials.com. And you can sign up there. So someone could just go create a brokerage account and yeah. start trading? Yeah, I can go. Yeah, this anytime. is crazy. Yeah. All yeah. right. I'm going to have to start doing it. When can we get <laughs> oh a Robin Hood integration? Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Good idea. Right? All right. This is so great. Thank you so much. Um, Thank we've you. been talking with Margaret Upshur, CEO and founder of Mobius Materials. Make sure to go to their website and learn more about the platform. And of course, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure to hit the subscribe button. You'll be able to keep up with all of our episodes from the PCB West 2025 show floor. We'll see you next time, everybody.